Hello, welcome to everyone tuning in and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jillian Perkins. I'm the Director of Communications at Arnert Messina, a Portland-based investment advisory firm bringing our unique and disciplined process and philosophy to high net worth individuals and families, nonprofit endowments and foundations, and corporate clients. In part one of this podcast series, Investment Committees More Than the Sum of Their Parts, we talked about committee structure, leadership, and decision-making processes. And now in part two today, we'll focus on traditional versus discretionary advisory services and what might lead a committee to consider these different approaches and why. Discretionary, also sometimes called OCIO, or Outsourced Chief Investment Officer Services, are becoming more popular with nonprofit investment committees, and we want to explore how this model is different from a traditional model and how a committee can select the type of service that will best fit its needs. So here to speak with us about traditional versus discretionary services is consultant Luca Arnrich. Over his more than 10 years working in financial services, Luca has worked directly with committees in both traditional and discretionary arrangements and brings expertise and understanding of both, both models to the table. So it's my pleasure to introduce Luca Arnrich. Hi Jillian, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. Uh, so Luca, can you begin just by giving us a little bit of background on your experience and your work with investment committees? Yeah, so, you know, by way of background, I was born and raised within Arnrich Messina. Tony Arnrich is my father. Uh, so from a very young age, I had a keen sense of investment philosophy, mm-hmm. business process and structure. And then after I went to college, uh, I ended up working in the markets and I actually worked for a short only hedge fund. So we made money only when the market went down. And if anybody knows what's happened <laughs> since 2009, the market's gone straight up. I lost yeah. a lot of hair follicles and <laughs> said I'm becoming too pessimistic at a young age. So I came back around a little over six years ago and had an opportunity to rejoin the firm Mm -hmm. and have uh, spent the last uh, six years working directly with committees, Mm -hmm. not only in the retirement plan space and also in the endowment and foundation space. And as you've indicated, working both in a discretionary and a non-discretionary manner. Right. So let's clarify uh, what the difference really is between a traditional approach to investment advisory services and a discretionary engagement. So can you tell me Uh, If an organization engaged us, what would they expect to experience in each of those different scenarios? Totally. So in each scenario, whether it's a traditional uh, advisory or discretionary advisory relationship, we're going to start out by by setting a framework for managing the portfolio through time. And that generally is, you know, through a, what we call an asset allocation process. And then from that asset allocation process, in terms of where we're putting our money in, tr- in different areas of the market, that leads to a framework in terms of what we call the investment policy statement. Mm-hmm. But then things kind of change after that, right? In really Really kind of the main difference is that there is a in a traditional advisory approach essentially the committee is responsible for the decision making of the portfolio through time mm-hmm. and that includes implementation changing managers um, you know examining research that we're providing to make a tactical tilt in the portfolio mm-hmm. based on the opportunities and risks that we see in the market but really in a discretionary services you know it's more of a governance role mm-hmm. you know if you're going to hire an investment advisor and we think it's you know better to use the full services of that investment firm. This is our day job. We're following the markets on a macro global basis on a, on you right. know, a daily basis essentially, and you know we have a strong investment committee process where we all come together and discuss these ideas, and then that leads to our implementation in our clients' portfolios. Mm-hmm. So in that discretionary world, we really take the onus off of the committee mm. from making those decisions and allow us to use our expertise to make portfolio decisions in a much more timely manner. Gotcha. So there's a big difference between those two. Big difference. What you take on in discretionary versus traditional. And probably a lot of reasons why an organization would think about switching to a discretionary approach. So let's start with the fiduciary liability. How? Tell me how that's different in a traditional engagement relative to um, if they're in a discretionary engagement. Yeah, totally. So at Arnold's Messina, it really doesn't matter where, whether you're in a traditional or discretionary relationship. We are fiduciary to the full extent of the law in either case. Mm-hmm. But really where it differs in terms of a discretionary relationship is that a committee or an organization can delegate that fiduciary uh, authority mm. for uh, managing the portfolio directly to us, right? That doesn't mean that absolves them fully from monitoring our success, from monitoring our actions, but really it allows them to spend more time focusing on long-term 
long-term you know mm. governance issues maybe long-term strategic planning right. and furthering their mission out in the the community rather than you know focusing on the decisions that need to be made within the investment portfolio mm -hmm. so a lot of times what that does is it, it creates uh, a system where you know those meetings tend to be much more concise mm. and uh, generally leads to better performance outcomes which we'll talk about here in a little bit but uh, overall it allows you to really kind of say hey you know we maybe don't have the full expertise to be making these decisions right. rather than putting that onus on us as a committee we can delegate some of that fiduciary authority to you as the investment advisor gotcha so you they pass on some of that fiduciary responsibility do they pass on any of the liability along with that as well yeah they definitely pass on some of that liability um, you know like I said we're, we're kind of unique in the world where you know we're a full full you know um, full fiduciary whether that's a traditional or discretionary piece but really on the discretionary side you know the contracts are different and uh, it basically you know explicitly states that we're going to be taking much more fiduciary responsibility and liability for managing the portfolio that's fantastic yep. so we talked a little bit about this but um, a lot of organizations look at discretionary services because of time and resource constraints and um, having limited time and resources. So tell me more about how a discretionary approach helps them conserve and manage their time and resources. Yeah, time management is one of the biggest things that we hear from our committees that we work with in a discretionary relationship. You know, also some things that, that you know, people consider in terms of whether or not to go discretionary is the investment sophistication of the committee. Also, you know, really making sure that you know the time that is spent with those board members uh, and you know having their various duties and their day jobs uh, can be really spent on focusing on furthering the mission of that foundation or endowment right and you know really when it when you look at it in a discretionary advisory relationship we can focus more on big picture issues we can um, you know not have to spend time on day-to-day -day management of the portfolio right. mm -hmm. generally what we see in a traditional advisory relationship is that we don't have the flexibility or the timeliness to implement portfolio decisions yep. you know given the changes in the markets right a lot of times and it's not uncommon to take anywhere from six months to make a decision in a portfolio wow. or in a retirement plan wow. right and you know because that's just based on the scheduling of meetings it just takes time yeah and you got yeah. things like summer right where people might be really hard to get get a whole group of, of people together right so really what the discretionary um, you know engagement allows is, is allows an organization to focus on that mission right. focus their time on long-term objectives right. furthering their mission in the community and allowing us to really kind of steward their assets but you know also keep us accountable you know to the board and, and to you know furthering that mission in the community right and so does that have an effect do you think on long-term performance performance outcomes definitely has a big effect on long-term performance outcomes you know um, when you have a traditional consulting approach like we just talked about you know it can take a while to make those changes right so from a portfolio context standpoint you know if you're starting to see some deterioration in let's say corporate bonds and corporate fundamentals we can make a shift pretty quickly maybe within a day or two based on that information in your portfolio to maybe more treasury based securities etc so that actually has been you know a significant you know value add is that if you can mm -hmm. you know be very opportunistic in terms of how the markets move and let's be honest the markets are very dynamic and so if I have to wait three to six months to get a decision um, you know you could miss out on that opportunity and could lead to significant underperformance over time that makes sense yeah or risk in your portfolio right oh yeah absolutely um, so overall what kind of advice do you have if committees are considering looking at discretionary versus a more traditional structure how do they decide that and um, how would they go about that process yeah so you know when committees are, are looking at whether or not to go to a discretion discretionary uh, engagement you know really kind of there's a few things that we look at does the committee have a lot of turnover mm. in our experience the most tenured uh, committee members are anywhere from one to three or four years right wow. it's very short yeah. so when you have continual turnover and then you have new ideas maybe new investment philosophies it's really hard to maintain consistency in the investment approach right. and when you're changing that every three to five years it really you know kind of thwarts your long-term progress and your goals right. right and especially for organizations who want to have that long-term perspective and long-term yeah. approach the other other major factors time and resources right mm -hmm. uh, a lot of endowments and foundations uh, particularly in a low return environment that we're seeing out of bonds and you know uh, looking forward in equities mm -hmm. uh, you know they're becoming more leaner 
right? And so they might not have the time and resources to fully dedicate, you know, to overseeing the portfolio within their internal staff. Mm -hmm. That also goes to the board or the investment committee that is in charge of, of, of managing the portfolio. So really kind of looking at the time and resources of that organization is huge. Um, also just, you know, shifting priorities as we talked about on the board level, right? Being able to focus on, you know, uh, the mission, being able to focus on big picture issues rather than having to, you know, have internal discussion and dialogue on whether or not, uh, you know, this investment advice is appropriate or not, right? right. So really kind of trusting that, that investment advisor is huge. Uh, and, you know, also, there is that component in terms of offloading that fiduciary responsibility and liability, right? Um, you know, that's what we really pride ourselves on as being, you know, a nationally uh, recognized uh, research and analytics um, firm and also being a great communicator. Mm -hmm. So our job is to kind of come in and make sure that from a discretionary standpoint, the committee is apprised of what's going on with the portfolio and where maybe we've underperformed or outperformed and any changes that we've made in the portfolio, which should overall lead to more time, uh, efficient time management right. and, you know, hopefully better potential long-term outcomes. Fantastic. Any last words or any last thoughts about um, what a committee might need to know in terms of making a decision about discretionary versus traditional? I really think it's up to the organization, right, mm -hmm. to look at their unique needs and say, hey, you know, is this is this traditional advisory relationship working for us? You know, have we have we achieved our long term goals? Is there better use of our time? Can we be a leaner, more efficient uh, advisor, you know, a more efficient uh, board and committee? Right. Mm -hmm. That's the type of stuff that I think that really when you're considering it and then also looking for firms like ours, right, yeah. that have a really well sourced uh, and staffed research and analytics department that has a very long-term track record of being able to grow with portfolios and implement, you know, various alternative asset classes, et cetera. Right. So those are where that, you know, and then particularly with those alternative asset classes, right, that's where you can get, you know, a lot of consternation among the committee because right. it's just, you know, very foreign to them. But yeah. in terms of uh, overall portfolio context, it can be very, you know, very useful and very, um, you know, accretive to the portfolio over time. Fantastic. Well, I think you provided an awful lot of great information for investment committees, and hopefully they'll find this uh, helpful in being able to determine what's going to work best for their organization. So I just want to say a huge thank you to Luca for sharing his insights and thoughts today. Thank you, Luca. Thanks. Julian, please, appreciate it. Yeah. Um, please visit our website at arnurchmessina.com. You can listen to part one of this podcast series where we discuss a little bit more about how committees can organize themselves and structure their decision-making processes overall for success and to read our full white paper investment committees more than the sum of their parts. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for listening to Arnurch Messina's podcast. Please see the podcast description for important copyright and disclaimer information.